answers. Welcome to Ask the Experts on 570 News. Advice and tips from the people who really know. Now here's your host, Dave Callender. Welcome to another edition of Ask the Experts. It's Neil Adams sitting in for Dave Callender for this first hour of the show. And I'm pleased to welcome back Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin, Boyce Michaelis and Associates Incorporated, a firm of trustees in bankruptcy. Uh, they started in Kitchener, Cambridge, and Guelph back in 1999. They've grown to more than 20 offices throughout southern Ontario. Uh, now, Scott and Ian, uh, you work as a team uh, to serve the Kitchener office at Hoy's Michaelis just a few blocks away from here uh, right, in, right. Uh, in downtown Kitchener. Uh, you're both chartered accountants uh, as well as licensed trustees in, in bankruptcy. Uh, now, today we're going to discuss uh, a variety of credit and debt-related topics. Uh, Scott and Ian, uh, let's, let's tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, Scott, you go first. Sure, okay. So I moved to uh, Kitchen-Waterloo um, to come to University of wilfrid Laurier from 93 to 97. Um, I, I took a double major between accounting and economics. So I, at that point, I made Kitchen-Waterloo my home, not growing up too far from here anyways. Um, went on to become a chartered accountant, and then I started in the insolvency in helping individuals deal with their uh, credit and debt issues um, in 2002. So I've been doing this quite a while now. Um, but this is really my, my niche of, of expertise is, is dealing with people and credit and debt uh, situations. Uh, Ian? Uh, I, I've taken a bit of a similar path as Scott. Uh, I moved to Waterloo Region about 20 years ago when I started at the University of Waterloo for accounting. So I, I also have a, a chartered accounting designation. A um, bit of a different path. I've been an employee of Hoyce Michaels for the last five years. Um, and it was just earlier this year where I finished the qualifications for my license as a trustee in bankruptcy. So um, a bit of a different path, but also similar. I've spent a lot of time advising individuals about uh, credit and debt-related questions. Okay. Uh, so Scott and Ian are going to provide some insight into the most common questions that they hear from, from people who are experiencing financial difficulty. Uh, what are some of the reasons that somebody may find themselves uh, in need of your services? And that's an interesting question because there's... And I, for, for a lot of people, understandably, there's uh, a fair amount of, um, I'll say, hesitation or embarrassment talking to to us about their circumstances. And but it's more to understand that there are a lot of very common reasons why people, uh, I guess, they're they're more at risk to be financially strapped. Right? And so the, I, I like to think of it as experiencing major life changes. So I mean, examples of that would be. Uh, going through a separation and divorce, and that could mean that there's all the extra legal costs related to that, but then also the changing of the monthly budget. You go from having two incomes, trying to manage uh, the household to only one income, and, and the reality is that life today is very, very expensive. Um, other major life changes would be, uh, the common ones would be something like an injury or an illness at work, uh, again, where it could mean extra expenses, but then also uh, a significant uh, downturn in terms of the income coming in and what that means is that with the availability of credit, most common examples meaning credit cards and lines of credit, people become reliant on, on those lines of, of credit or forms of credit to um, basically live day-to-day -day life. And, and that's unfortunately a recipe for disaster uh, because at some point in time you need to deal with those debts. Mm -hmm. uh, bankruptcy, the big B, uh, a scary word, uh, no doubt. Um, what does it mean to be a licensed trustee in bankruptcy? Uh, all it, it, it means that we are uh, licensed by the government to facilitate personal bankruptcies and consumer proposals for individuals. But our role goes beyond that. Um, we are ones who are appointed by the government or approved, uh, not appointed, sorry, approved by the government to uh, facilitate the, the legislation in Canada to do this, uh, which makes us mean that we have to sit down, review options with people, talk to them about all their options, not just bankruptcies, not just proposals. We're just two average guys that uh, help individuals deal with their debts. Um, a lot of people here, a licensed trustee in bankruptcy, they're, they're, who is that? What is it? Well, that's two of us. That's what we are. Um, so really, a licensed trustee in bankruptcy is just a person who is able to help people deal with their debts, and if they need to, uh, use the legislation to help them get a fresh start. Yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that as well, Scott, because, again, getting back to the idea of um, you know fear about talking to anybody about mm -hmm. financial difficulties, but oftentimes there's that extra layer of fear that, well, if I talk to a bankruptcy trustee, he's going to tell me I, I have to go bankrupt. And there's this uh, misconception out there that the, that the trustee simply works for the creditors. And there is some element of that that we'll touch on later. But really, our primary role, as Scott said, is just to talk to people about their circumstances, you know, understand what's going on, and lay out for them their different options. And oftentimes, many times, 
that means using somebody else's service, not using us at all. And we're, we're just there. He said, we're just two guys. You know, we spend our working days talking to people about their circumstances, even if it means that we're not the right guys to help them out of their predicament. Uh, and in, in today's age, uh, the, the Internet is, is so prevalent. I mean, you can, you can type in the word bankruptcy to uh, a search engine and get, you know, thousands and thousands of, of results. Uh, the media full uh, of advertisements and, and things like that offering help for, for debt problems. Uh, is there any difference between the services being offered by different companies? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, licensed trustee firms should all be the same. We are all appointed by the, the or uh, licensed by the government to do this. Um, there are a bunch of other people that try to give people financial advice. Um, if you're paying for it, you question that because if you go talk to your banker, they're not going to charge you a, a fee to, to sit down in there and talk to them. You can go to Mosaic Family Counseling over on Queen Street uh, and talk to them for free. You mm-hmm. can go and talk to, you know, your pastor. You can go and talk to anybody who's out there to, and talk to them about their options. Somebody should not be charging you a fee to sit down and just say, you need help. Let's talk to you. Let's point you in the right direction. Let's find a solution. So if, if somebody wants to charge you a fee for something, really question that to say, why do I have to pay you a fee to talk to you about my situation? Um, so I think there is a, a big difference on that. I get the confusion out there. I get that people are scared, worried about their situation. Uh, when you're at a cocktail party, people don't sit and say, I'm having financial troubles. I can't pay my credit card this month. Well, how about you? you know, how, how's it going for you? Mm-hmm. People don't talk about those things. They hold it sacred. So the first time they talk to somebody, they're not sure who to turn to. Um, never be afraid to call a trustee's office and say, here's my situation. What should I be doing? And talk to them. People will walk you through the options. Um, and then just point in the right direction. Well, another part of being licensed or approved by the government to to talk to people about their circumstances is that we're also very highly regulated and monitored and scrutinized by the government as well in terms of how we conduct our practice. And the other um, kinds of parties out there that are offering advice, and realistically, it sounds very similar to the kinds of things that Scott and I talk about on a regular basis. But the point is, other people out there, they don't go through the same kind of rigorous process we, we do to get to where we are, and they're not regulated by the government. They're not scrutinized by the government. And that, realistically, sometimes it feels like a bit of a, a Wild West show out there where people, it's, it's, it's a business, right? And, and mm-hmm. people are trying to get paid for their, for their time and their work, and I, I appreciate that. But there's uh, other companies out there that will prey on that fear and uncertainty and charge you uh, fees when really there's a different way to go about it and you should be getting, um, you can get free unbiased advice from Scott and I anytime. And ultimately a lot of the places out there um, end up referring people to see a trustee in bankruptcy for a consumer proposal or a person of bankruptcy and they paid a fee for that. If they went directly to that trustee firm, there would have been zero fee. There mm-hmm. been, that person was not needed for it. So just ask a lot of questions. The biggest part, the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody is when you're looking into your situation, ask a ton of questions of what's going on. Be informed. And really, do do your homework. I mean, if, it sounds to me as if you're if you're getting asked for a fee up front as you walk in the office and and sit down ready to have a discussion that is is very hard to to start with. Right. Uh, then you should definitely be. You, you haven't done your homework. One, that's your first mistake. And and two, you should probably get out of there. Right. And uh, and not pay that fee and, and do that homework. Right. And I guess just one other comment, Neil. It's it's. I mean, Scott and I we talk about our 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 background, our credentials. For a reason, mm-hmm. right? We 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 had to work hard to get to where we are, and part of this homework process that you're talking about is that people, when they're sitting at home and they're not sure to whom they should be speaking and they're afraid of talking to a trustee, well, if you're talking to somebody else, don't be afraid to ask what their background is. You know, what is their education? What is their background? Are they licensed by the government to do what they're doing? That's part of the questioning process to figure out is this person the right person to help me through my situation. Uh, the Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin uh, in studio with me. Ask the experts. Uh, they're from Hoy's Michaelis and Associates Inc. Uh, let's give the phone numbers here. Uh, Three ten plan or uh, online at at Hoy's dot com. If they if somebody's listening today and they they want to give you guys a shout on on Monday when the office is open. Uh, Ask the experts uh, continues. Neil Adams filling in for Dave Calendar. We'll be right back. You're listening to Five Seventy News. Ask the experts with your host, Dave Callender. 
Welcome back to Ask the Experts. Neil Adams in today for Dave Callender and with me from Hoy's Michaelson Associates Incorporated, Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin, trustees in bankruptcy. Uh, and we kind of touched on it earlier, but uh, provide an overview of the different options uh, that people can can have to deal with their debts. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll uh, address that, Neil. And I guess the... Um not like I've ever taken a formal count on this, but I, I figure I must use the word options uh, several hundred times during the course of a, of a normal work week. Um, big picture, the way I see it, I mean, your, your options fall into two broad categories. So there's the scenarios where people are working to, quote unquote, pay their debts in full. And then there's the other category where it's simply not realistic. So let's, let's talk about that first group first. And the reason why people should be striving to pay their debts in full is that, um, well, it's, it's morally and socially the right thing to do, but then also there's no negative impact in terms of the credit rating. So the second category, realistic, I keep saying realistically, but realistically, if you're not paying the debts back in full, that means that it will have some kind of negative reflection on the credit rating, and that's why you only look at those things if the other options aren't realistic. So within paying your debts in full, you sometimes people are able to find ways to change their budget, cut out some discretionary expenses, Maybe find some extra sources of income, a uh, part-time job, maybe rent out the basement uh, for some extra income. Um, sometimes people are able to uh, sell some possessions or assets that are no longer that important to them, perhaps a, an old trailer or a second vehicle, maybe liquidate some investments. Um, those kinds of things, most times by the, people, by the time people are talking to us, most times those are not realistic anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, people often ask us about a consolidation loan. There's a lot of misinformation about what a consolidation is. And what that is is basically... Uh, replacing one group of debts with a different debt. So that means not, not necessarily talking to me and Scott because we don't lend money, but that would be going talking to your bank or perhaps a credit union who is willing to lend you money to wrap all your high interest debts into one low interest payment. The challenge there is finding the person who's willing to lend you money because that person then is concerned about the risk of you not being able to pay it back. So mm. they go through a risk assessment process where they're saying, well, if, if Ian walked in and, and wanted to borrow $20,000 to consolidate his credit cards into one payment, well, what's what's the guarantee I have that he'll be able to pay me back the 20%? Does he have a house with equity that he could give as security? Does he have a strong co-signer? So, again, most times by the by the time people are talking to us about the situation, they've exhausted these kinds of alternatives. But if it turns out, I had a call from somebody just earlier this week where there was significant equity in the house, so the conversation was actually very short, and the advice was to talk to the bank about a perhaps redoing the mortgage or a secured line of credit to wrap the credit cards basically into the mortgage payment. And they, they had good solid income, and that was hopefully a realistic option. And hopefully I was able to point them in that direction. So that was category one. Category two is where you can't pay the debts in full. And that would be perhaps doing a debt management plan through a place like Mosaic Counseling. Scott mentioned them earlier. Mm -hmm. What they're able to do is oftentimes talk to the banks and, and get some fairly significant concessions on the interest rates, but then work on paying back the full amount of the debt over time and then what Scott and I do is to administer uh, consumer proposals and, and bankruptcies, which are very formal processes regulated by the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Okay, so somebody's listening, us, li listening to us today. They're out driving around or, you know, they're sitting at home uh, and, you know, they type in hoys.com into the, into the browser. They pick up the phone, call 310 plan. Uh, what's next? Uh, that's a first step. I think reaching out to ask somebody questions is a first step. Uh, what we do is we talk to them. We ask them what's happening. What what brought them to call us today? Um, what is their debt situation? What is their income situation? What's changed? We go through the understanding what is important to them, what's their situation, and then we go through that ladder that Ian just brought down to say, what are these options that you have? We, we go down them, and we start talking about the pros and cons about it. So the person then can get some thoughts going for their situation. What can they do to work on a plan for the future. I mean, our, our, our phone number is 310 plan for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's to plan out what am I going to do today going forward for work, for family, for budgets, for, for my financial situation. All those parts have to fit into it. It's, it's kind of like a puzzle, putting the pieces in, in at the right time. So the first thing they do is they reach out, they call us, we talk to them, we can get them in for a free meeting to sit down and, and expand on that conversation. I mean, most times it's about a 45-minute meeting we have with people just going through information so we can send them home and give them more homework to do to try yeah. to figure out what's going on. Things don't happen overnight. It's about, you know, taking your situation now, considering it, looking at it, making a long-term plan. It's not a Band-Aid. It's a long-term solution. I was just going to say, uh, uh, it's not a Band-Aid solution, a Band-Aid for a broken leg. This Correct. is something that, you know, right. you, you, you get it set in place. You offer the, the, the help uh, and that's that's really needed. Right. right. And what, what I find is that it's very often that the first communication with somebody, whether it's on the phone or, or a simple email message, that 
without having any kind of context of their situation, sometimes we'll get the simple question saying, well, what, what's the right option for me? Or is a bankruptcy the right answer for me? Or is a consumer proposal the right answer for me? And though it sounds a little bit of a soft answer, the answer is, well, it depends, right? We need to have an interactive conversation where we understand the circumstances, like Scott was saying, to be able to truly assess it. So to say, well, here's the right answer for you, perhaps, given your situation, there's no one right answer that satisfies all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Everyone's situation is different, and what they need to define is the one that works the best for them. Uh, so we've tossed around the B word uh, already today, not Band-Aid, uh, bankruptcy, <laughs> uh, a, a word that we've all heard before. Uh, and I suspect that most of us do not know what's involved with, with bankruptcy. What's it all about? Um, I'll, I'll jump in on that one, Neil. And I guess even before saying that, it's very normal that people call us up. They understand that we're trustees in bankruptcy, and they assume that bankruptcy is the only thing that's going to work for them. And oftentimes that is not the case. But if bankruptcy, sometimes though, bankruptcy is on paper, the only thing that makes sense for people. So what, what it is, is a legal process whereby a person who is unable to pay their debts in full is legally allowed to not pay their debts back in full. We use the word insolvent quite often. So what that means is that somebody uh, doesn't have the ability to, to sell or refinance their assets to pay their debts in full. They don't have enough money coming in on a monthly basis to pay for their normal, reasonable living expenses plus pay their debts in full, or maybe some combination of the two. So if a person is insolvent, they can file a bankruptcy and upon satisfying certain conditions, they're illegally discharged from bankruptcy, uh, therefore not required to pay the debts back. There are some exceptions to that. There are some debts that don't go away through bankruptcy. The most common example that we see would be like a family support order where somebody's required to pay uh, child support or spouse support. But that's the general idea. The trade-off, well, if, you know, so, so far that sounds really good, right? So I don't have to pay my debts back. But the trade-off is sometimes people have possessions or assets that are not protected by law. So then we have to step in sometimes and potentially... We, we call it realizing. We have to realize on assets sometimes. And sometimes it gets misconstrued as, as having to take things from people and selling them. But if basically a, an asset isn't protected by law, then we have to recover that money either by selling it or by the bankrupt person or a third party paying so that that person can keep the asset. Okay. Uh, so uh, being uh, working at 570 News, I read news stories uh, about people uh, going to court-related bankruptcies. Uh, how are the courts involved, Scott? Well, the, the courts are the overseer of all. Um, Court involvement in a typical bankruptcy is non-existent. It doesn't have to be there. Um, when somebody files bankruptcy, there's a stay of proceedings. Their debts are now protected by the courts. So the courts are involved in the sense that the court is the one that's protecting that individual. Mm-hmm. Somebody can't be garnished. They can't have collections against them. They can't have phone calls. They can't have all that stuff because they got this global court protection. The Act, the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, is, has three principles. One is giving the honest but unfortunate debtor a fresh start. Number two is helping the person work through that fresh start. They call it rehabilitation, starting all over. Three is a fair and equal treatment of the creditors. So generally, if all those cases are there, that it's fair and equal to the creditors, it's about an honest but unfortunate debtor getting a fresh start, there isn't that much involved in it. There are times that things do go to court. Um, A creditor opposition could happen, meaning their creditors kind of took offense to what somebody did right beforehand. Chances are, if we all looked at the case, we might say, yeah, that didn't really make sense. Um... The other part is, is is if somebody couldn't complete their bankruptcy on time, we then can get the court to give us more time to do that. Okay. So there's sometimes a very positive thing, but ultimately most times the courts aren't directly, there's no court hearing required. Um, I just pulled the stats. There's been hundred and just under 150,000 Canadians filed a, a bankruptcy in the last two years. It would be a very small number of that 150 that actually had to go to court. Okay. Um, so, But we, we'll explain to people where we think there could be concerns about that. Uh, okay, so let's go to the, uh, the the next question I have. People must ask uh, uh, all the time about what they're allowed to keep if they file for bankruptcy. Uh, how does that work? Right. That, that's obviously a big cause of concern for people. And and getting back to the, some of the principles with the, the Bankruptcy and Solvency Act, the idea isn't to to take literally everything from somebody. The idea is to leave the, the quote-unquote honest but unfortunate debtor with the means for a reasonable standard of living. And through those principles, there's there's federal and provincial law that allow people to, to keep most of the possessions within certain dollar limits. I find that most of the concerns are focused on things like houses and cars and maybe some kinds of investments. So with a, with a house, the real question is is equity. Right? So if you take a look at the market value, you take into account the mortgage, other disposition costs if the house had been sold. If there's positive equity, then in a bankruptcy, the trustee has the responsibility to realize on that. And as I said before, the options are to either sell the house, which obviously most people don't want that, mm-hmm. but if it's a fairly small amount, then oftentimes we can come up with a payment arrangement where the person pays for that equity over time. 
because, again, most times families want to keep the houses. But if that number is too large, that equity is too large, it could mean that a different option is more reasonable. Perhaps a consumer proposal would be a better answer because in a proposal, the trustee doesn't have that um, responsibility to realize on the assets. Uh, the uh, the experts, uh, Scott Schaefer, Ian Martin, in from Hoyes, Michaelis & Associates, Inc. on Ask the Experts today, right here on 570 News. It's Neil Adams in for Dave Callender. Uh, if you want to give us a call, maybe you're listening to this, you want to sp- uh, speak to Scott and Ian, 519-570-2545. Out of town, you can get us 1-800-570-5715. Uh, if you feel that you'd want to do it more in, in private, uh, 310 plan is the number, or you can visit hoys.com. We're going to take a quick break. More Ask the Experts uh, back uh, after the news. You've got questions. We've got answers. Welcome to Ask the Experts on 570 News. Advice and tips from the people who really know. Now here's your host, Dave Callender. Welcome back to Ask the Experts. Neil Adams in for Dave Callender. And joining me in studio, Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin, the the experts from Hoyes, Michaelis & Associates Incorporated, a firm of trustees in bankruptcy. Uh, Scott and Ian working together as a team uh, out of the Kitchener office uh, of Hoyes, Michaelis. And we've been speaking about uh, bankruptcy. Uh, and, and earlier, we, we talked about that the, uh, the cost depends on the bankrupt person's income. Uh, what does that mean, Scott? part, uh, but I'll simplify it. The more somebody makes, the more it would cost them. We talked about the three principles of the act, giving somebody a fresh start, helping them through it, and balancing the rights of the creditors. So the government has set limits of what people are allowed to make before they're expected to pay back part of their debts to the creditors. The fancy term that the government uses is it's called surplus income. So if we had two different situations, two different people would pay different amounts of money into the bankruptcy because it's based upon their income. Okay. I'm going to do a real simple example. If somebody makes $2,500 take-home pay, take-home after the government taxes, after paying child support, um, anything like that, they make $2,500, the government says you're allowed to make $2,000 a month, 2006 to be exact, but let's call it $2,000 for simple math. They are $500 over the government's limit. they got to pay half of that into the bankruptcy, $250 that month. Okay. So the cost is strictly attributable to how much money somebody makes. It is confusing, but it, it's really a simple calculation to sort of say, here's what you make, here's what the cost would be. And I guess the, the the key word in bankruptcy is that you're seeking to be discharged from bankruptcy. It's at that point that you're released from the uh, legal obligations. So this part that Scott's talking about with the income, it also affects the, um, the the length of time. So somebody who is underneath those government limits can be discharged from a first-time bankruptcy in only nine months, whereas uh, for somebody who goes over those limits, they pay that, that surplus payment for 21 months. So it, it's really that balancing act between the individual's right to a fresh start with the creditor's right to be treated fairly. And as Scott said, basically somebody who makes more pays more, and that way the creditors get more. Uh, what about the fee for your for your services? Excellent question, and one of the most common questions. And I think a large part of that is because of um, there are other places out there who aren't licensed by the government who are charging upfront fees. So people are normally, understandably skeptical about that. So our conversation so far was focused on saying, well, sometimes assets aren't protected, where we might have to sell them or you pay for them. There's a surplus component that Scott was just talking about. So that gets deposited into a trust account. We call that the estate. And then... Because we are the independent party where we have no vested interest in it, we get paid out of the total funds. And there's it's called a tariff, but basically it's a formula from the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act that says what portion of the estate funds get paid to us as our fee. And that way, it's supposed to be totally transparent where people can't say we have a conflict of interest in getting paid and stuff like that. And also there should be, we've said, I feel like a broken record here, but we say it over and over, you should be not paying anything up front in terms of an assessment fee. Okay. Uh, are there special considerations uh, for tax debts? Okay. I'll jump in on that one. I have a bit of a background. I, I used to be uh, an employee of the Canada Revenue Agency, so I get uh, I get a lot of the tax questions around the office. Sure. Um, so it's a very common misconception that tax debts are not included in a bankruptcy, that bankruptcy won't take care of those. So the, the general answer in most situations is that a bankruptcy will deal with uh, taxes just the same as a line of credit or a credit card. Um, there is a special power that the government has where if you ignore it for too long and you have a house, they might register a lien against your house without your consent. So so assuming that isn't the case, right? if if, if they haven't registered a lien, then a bankruptcy will take care of, of tax debts. And the idea is that if they had registered a lien, it's basically, it's kind of like a mortgage against the house and meaning that a bankruptcy won't, won't remove that lien from the house. 
So it's important to try to deal with the taxes before it gets too far. And the only thing that I'll add to that is that there's um, there's there's been an uh, over time there, there's uh, some portion of the population where uh, insolvency or bankruptcy is driven almost exclusively by having high tax debt. So going back to almost exactly four years, there were some revisions to the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act where what they call tax-driven or high tax debt situations um, basically automatically prompt a court hearing where the courts might review the situation and set um, extra conditions on the person completing their bankruptcy. So the basic uh, parameters there are that if the tax debts are $200,000 or more and it represents 75% or more of the total tax debts, you have to go to court to get your discharge, as opposed to being handled exclusively through the trustee's office. So that is a special consideration for high tax debts. Uh, we hear so much about uh, credit ratings and, and bankruptcies. Do, are, are they intertwined? Are they, is, is that affected at all by, uh, by a bankruptcy, your credit well, rating? 100%. Uh, let's talk about credit ratings for a second. Credit ratings, I like to also call this credit history. It is a history that somebody then uses to make a decision about something for you. So the... My personal belief would be the only time credit rating or credit history matters is the time you apply for something new. Because if you have all your debts and you're never going to apply for something ever again, nobody's ever going to look at your credit rating or your credit history. Mm -hmm. So credit rating is used to decide, will I lend to you? What interest rate will it be? Do I need a cosign or do I want security? So somebody's making a decision on you as a risk for that. A bankruptcy is legislated that it will be on somebody's, uh, will be reported by the government that it has happened. It stays on somebody's credit rating for six or seven years afterwards. Two credit bureaus, one reports it for six years, the other is seven years after it's done. Um, that's a footnote to say it happened. So when we sit down with somebody, we're going to say, here's all the options. Here's the impact on your credit rating. Yes, bankruptcy does affect it. The trade-off is, does this allow you then to rebuild financially to then start all over again? Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes yes, it is. Um, I do like to give the examples that the banks... Um, do like to see somebody discharged for two years before they'll consider them for a mortgage again. Not the six or seven years we just talked about it. Somebody's going to look at they got a fresh start, their debts are cleared. At that point, then somebody's going to make a new decision based upon the new history. Okay. So, um, y yes, it does. And each case will be a little bit different. So is is that uh, two years from the, the end of the six to seven years? No. That, so there's a couple different ends there. So Ian referred to the discharge. So somebody enters into bankruptcy, um, their first time bankruptcy will be 9 or 21 months long. Okay. Once they're done that, that's when they're discharged. They're discharged, their debts are officially discharged. So somebody enters into bankruptcy, their debts go, they sit with the courts. They, they can't collect, they're not gone yet. Once the person gets discharged 9 or 21 months later, then their debts are then at that point discharged. That's when that footnote starts recording, but that's when the banks really start looking. Okay, you're now starting all over. You're now talking, it's now time to look at rebuilding. It's now starting the, the new future at that point. Okay. I'm going to jump in, Neil, just for a second there, sure. because I feel like I don't feel like we've said this, but I think it's an important thing to say. I mean, we sit here and we talk about bankruptcy, and it's not to say that bankruptcy is a good thing. I mean, the thing that that I'd like to say that I haven't said is that bankruptcy is absolutely the last resort. Right. right. <laughs> and as we touched on before, people should be striving to pay their debts in full if at all possible, and and that's why this and some of the other options are only well, I view bankruptcy as the last resort. But the other things like a consumer proposal, they're not desirable. They're just potentially more desirable than a bankruptcy. And yeah. as I said, any one of these compromises, we're not paying the debts back. It has this potential lingering effect on the credit rating. So you really need to decide, you know, which which side of the fence are you on? Will I pay my debts in full? Can I pay my debts in full? Or am I simply not? And then if you're in the second category, just trying to figure out which of these answers is the best given my, my, my circumstances. So let's talk about uh, consumer proposals. Uh, what What is that? Well, a consumer proposal is under the same legislation as, as a bankruptcy. It's under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. It is a legal settlement of somebody's debts, in simple terms. It is an offer that an individual makes uh, to their creditors to say, here's what I can afford to pay, either as a lump sum, a payment plan, no more than five years, or a combination of a lump sum plus a payment plan, uh, at which time the creditors get to, to vote on it, and the courts at that point make it legally binding once it's been accepted by the creditors. So it is in all simple simple terms, is a offer by somebody to their creditors when they can't afford to pay it back, but they can afford to pay part of it back. Um, so, oh, yeah, so so really, it's it's a way of of um, well, I like to say that it's it's a way of getting the same end result as bankruptcy, okay. where you're not required to repay the full amount of the debt. There's just a different way of accomplishing it. So we were talking before about bankruptcy might mean that you can't. Um, you know, keep your house or there's certain kinds of investments that might not be protected. 
Whereas in a proposal, the trustee has no authority to, to realize on those assets. So a proposal allows people to keep their possessions. And the idea is that they're offering over a maximum of five years to repay effectively more than what the creditors would get through bankruptcy. So, and that's really why most times through this voting process in a, in a consumer proposal, most times the creditors will agree to it. So it's kind of like a happy middle ground, well, happy-ish middle ground for, for both sides. Okay. I mean, the creditors are happy because they're getting more money compared to bankruptcy as the last resort. And then the individual is happy because they're dealing with the debts without going through bankruptcy, potentially paying the surplus penalty, potentially losing their house. It's just a different way of dealing with it. It's really about giving people uh, stability. I mean, ultimately, if somebody has gone through a volatile situation, they work for a large company in Kitchener-Waterloo area, and then you've been downsized, you've been cut out of the, the equation, you find a new job, but paying you a lot less. Mm-hmm. Now you have money to pay for your mortgage, you have money to look after the kids, you have money to pay for your car payment, but now that the unsecured debt that you've accumulated over time, that is now too big for you to deal with because your circumstances have changed. You've been through a separation. You've been through uh, a downsizing at work. You've been off work for medical reasons that put you behind. So once somebody has that that, that nest egg of, of debts that they can't handle, a proposal allows them to offer a deal and bring back that stability to their life. Do, do we perhaps have time for a simple numeric example? Sure, go ahead. Because I mean, the, the situation Scott was just describing, that's so common. There's been... So many different companies in our community that have downsized over time. So the very common scenario is that we're meeting with a husband and wife. There's some aspects of stability in their life, and maybe somebody got downsized a couple of years ago. They relied on the credit card, lines of credit, and now they're sitting with, say, thirty to $40,000 of, of debt owing. And bankruptcy probably isn't the right answer because maybe they have a house in the suburbs with a little bit of equity. Um, they have some income where maybe they'd have to pay the surplus penalty. And then also bankruptcy often has a bit more of a, an emotional stigma, stigma rather, Compared to um, compared to doing a proposal, so somebody in that situation might be able to offer an arrangement or a settlement to the group of of creditors, the the credit card companies, to say, well, I can't pay it all back. I don't really want to go bankrupt. What if I paid you guys something like fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars over the next five years, maybe a monthly payment of two fifty to three hundred dollars a month? So through that process, the the creditors they get to see all the same information as mm-hmm. they would in bankruptcy. They see well how much equity would have been for us there. Are there other assets that the trustee would have had to realize in a bankruptcy? Well, you know what? It's not perfect. I'm, I'm pretending I'm the bank here, right? It's not perfect. I'd much rather get paid in full. But if I'd only get that little amount of bankruptcy, maybe I should say yes to this proposal instead. Okay. And if I can chime in one more time, in Ontario, looking back at the stats over the last two years. Essentially, it's equal number of people filing proposals of bankruptcies in, in the last two years. Just a hair goes more to proposals. So it's not an uncommon thing. We've heard about bankruptcies forever and ever now because mm-hmm. it's existed forever. Proposals, it came in, into legislation in 92. So it's still, in whole scheme of things, relatively new laws. But Ontarians are now going to consumer proposals more often than they would a bankruptcy because it gives them that protection and stability. Uh, we got to take a quick break. It is Ask the Experts. Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin in from Hoyes Michaelis and Associates Incorporated, a firm of trustees in bankruptcy. You're listening to Ask the Experts. It's Neil Adams filling in. This is 570 News. Wow. 570 News returns to Ask the Experts. Here's Dave Callender. Welcome back to Ask the Experts. Neil Adams in for Dave Callender. And uh, joining us this hour has been Scott Schaefer and Ian Martin from Hoyes Michaelis and Associates Incorporated, a firm of trustees in bankruptcy. Uh, been talking a lot about uh, bankruptcy over the first half of the show. Uh, we're into consumer proposals uh, right now. Is there any is there any real difference between who's eligible to file for a consumer proposal? Um, yes, uh, and it's uh, consumer proposals for an individual. It's not for businesses. There are options for businesses as well. A consumer proposal is for somebody who owes less than $250,000 excluding a mortgage on their house. So pretty much most people fall into that category. Um, so it is about four individuals who are unable to pay their debts in full. So A, you, you can't be able to pay your debts. You have to owe less than $250,000, um, and, and you have to be at a point where you need to settle the debts at that point. So really, it's pretty open to Canadians. It's Canadian law. It's it's set up for anybody who needs a fresh start as a means to deal with their debt. All right. Uh, a bankruptcy is, is filed with the bankruptcy trustees. Are there similar restrictions for consumer proposals? Uh, s- simple answer is yes. Uh, we've been talking about how there are various provisions within the Bankruptcy Insolvency Act related to proposals. So um, 
Similar regulations to administer a consumer proposal, it has to be with a licensed trustee in bankruptcy. And I'm going to touch on something here that is a, a bit of a, a, a source of frustration for the kind of work that we do, because th there are um, you know different companies that offer offer advice to deal with your circumstances, and um, quite often we, we hear it in, in a number of different uh, forms, whether it's radio or internet. But oftentimes there's there's reference to so-called government programs where you're able to eliminate your credit card debt by certain high percentages. What they're basically referring to is a consumer proposal, okay. right? And we talked about how it's it's basically a settlement for less than the full amount. So, so again, I want to make sure I get this clear. So if you're if you're dealing with somebody and they're talking about a consumer proposal, ask about their credentials because ultimately, if you're filing a consumer proposal under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, you have a trustee who is administering that. A very common practice, including in our community and Waterloo Region, companies will talk about um, these government programs, they'll meet with you, they'll charge you some kind of fee to prepare a bunch of paperwork, and then they refer to a court officer who is basically the trustee in bankruptcy, but this person's done all the upfront work. The real challenge here is that they've charged you a fee outside the proposal that really you should not be paying. Right? Scott and I sit down with people, we have a couple consultations to get the paperwork together, there's nothing paid up front, there's no fee to sit down for that. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, we get paid in a proposal similarly to how we get paid in a bankruptcy, right? We get paid out of the total payment. There's no fee in addition to that. So the source of frustration is companies taking advantage of that fear and uncertainty and charging additional fees when there's really no need to be paying that fee. Correct. I mean, a trustee in bankruptcy is an officer of the courts. I mean, one of the nicest parts about our business is we never have to serve jury, jury duty. We're exempt from it. <laughs> um, so they refer to us as officer of the courts. It's nothing fancy. This is us. Look, I mean, if you're on, on the internet right now, you can watch us live. We are the, the people that have it. So if somebody's saying, I'm, you got to pay me a fee to go see an officer of the court, you don't have to. Just go see a trustee. Uh, what about the cost for a, a consumer proposal? I know we... we, we yeah, yeah so we started pretty... about that. And I guess the even before addressing that, Scott made a comment that made really made me think about something. And... If you're if you're meeting with somebody about the situation, you should be asking about their credentials. You know, is it a proposal? Okay, well, who's the trustee? Is it you? Well, why am I paying you a fee if you're not the trustee? So, um, again, the idea is that we construct a um, we, we help people construct a, a reasonable payment plan that the creditors would find attractive. They make those payments to us. It gets deposited into a trust account. But then there's there's um, a formula within the Bankruptcy and Solvency Act that says how much of that total that the trustee rather is allowed to pay himself as his fee. So the point is, when we're talking to people about a monthly payment, that is that person's total cost. Any kind of fee that we pay to ourselves comes out of that total. So if you're ever talking to somebody about any kind of upfront fees in addition to monthly costs, there's really no need for that at all. Does a does a consumer proposal hurt your credit rating? We we talked about it with bankruptcy. Yep. Uh, so once again, the, the government, the superintendent of bankruptcy, is the one that reports a footnote on somebody's credit rating. It stays on there for three years after it's all paid off. Um, one thing that does happen is creditors' information purges. It stops being seen by the by the public six years after it's reported. So the fact of the matter is we refer, once again, to history. If you've had a debt and you paid it off in full, that's still going to be noted on your credit rating for the next six years. Once they stop reporting it, it's still visible to the for that, that point in time. So it's important that a proposal stays on there longer to say, the debts have now been taken care of. But realistically, going back to it, it's about a plan for the future. So it's about building, creating stability, dealing with the debt so you can live debt-free. I mean, a, a phrase that we haven't used very much today is becoming debt-free. Mm -hmm. This isn't to get back into debt again. This is to be living debt-free, living on cash, living without having to use credit cards, living to be able to pay the mortgage, pay the family, pay different things, and save, invest, uh, create create a new future. Yeah, I, I say it all the time that... Uh, the obligations that people have through through different forms of debt, and we focused on things like credit cards, but you know, car payments, mortgages, these are all financial obligations. And taking on the, basically the more obligations you have, the more at risk you put yourself. If you if you do experience some kind of uh, unexpected um, downturn in terms of your economic situation, the more obligations you have, the less flexibility you have, the more at risk it puts you of, of becoming insolvent and having to um, to explore some of these different options that we've been touching on here today. Uh, so whether you go with a somebody goes with a consumer proposal or they go with with bankruptcy to to deal with their debts, uh, how do they go about rebuilding uh, their credit rating? So rebuilding credit rating is meaning you become uh, for a bank to really want to lend to you again. You become appealing to somebody to want to lend to you. So the way to rebuild credit rating is obtaining assets, obtaining job security, obtaining stability in where you're living and how often you move. Um, Looking at saving money again, do you have any assets? Do you have things? And what are you borrowing the money for? Are you getting a loan to buy a car? Are you getting a loan for a mortgage? 
Are you getting just a $20,000 line of credit to just have? Um, uh, rebuilding credit is different for everybody, but it's really about what am I trying to obtain? So not having a lot of debt is a great way to rebuild credit. Uh, having maybe one card that you use and pay off every month, put a nominal amount of money onto it, um, by really not using a lot of credit, you become more credit worthy again because the more you have, the next person is not going to lend to you again because you've already had that part. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And even when, um, well, your, your question, Neil, was focused more on, on after a proposal or after bankruptcy, but even when we're meeting with somebody for the first time and they're, they're apprehensive about doing one of these things because of the credit rating, a normal question that I pose is, well, you're concerned about your credit rating, but how, how is it right now? I mean, ultimately the test is, if you walked out and applied for a credit card or a line of credit or a mortgage or a, a car or whatever, right? As you are right now struggling to make your payments, would you get approved for something like that? And the answer is no, then people are, are, are struggling desperately to preserve something that is already damaged. So yeah. sometimes it's necessary to take, it feels like a bit of a step back, but sometimes it's it's necessary to take that step back to take a bigger step forward in the long term. Mm-hmm. There's no perfect solution, but there's good solutions t- for each person to figure out, well, what works for me? How do I deal with my debts? How do I rebuild in the long term? There's no band-aids. Um, it is a long-term healing process that people just need to go through to, to get through it. And, and really in today's society, I mean, that's what people are looking for, right? Is they're looking for that quick fix. They think they can, you know, uh, the, their debts are here today and then and then gone tomorrow or, or gone next month. But but that's not necessarily the case at all. Right. And and I feel like I've, I've said this a couple times today, but I come back to the idea of buyer beware. So if you're talking to a so-called expert about dealing with your finances and they make you promises of a quick fix, I mean, that that's... You, you want to be wary. You want to be cautious. You want to you want to know who you're who you're dealing with, right? mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's it's important to be skeptical, you know, reasonably skeptical, and ask questions to understand what you're in for. Yeah, if you've been through changes, if you've been through a lot of things, it's a matter of making that plan for the future, really figuring out what's going, what what where do you want to be, what do you need to do, how do you get there, and and continuing to evolve that plan. Uh, we got about uh, two minutes left. Uh, we we talked uh, about bankruptcy as well as consumer proposals. Uh, what about borrowing money to to consolidate your debts? A great option if you can afford it. Make sure it's a great option to, to borrow money, to pay off the debts, to consolidate them if you can afford it long term. If you're one of the persons working at that uh, big company in Waterloo right now that has announced big layoffs and you might be one of those guys on the chopping block, getting a big loan today isn't going to solve it down the road. Be weary of, of co-signers. I mean, some people say they're great. I think the banks are, are have the top economists in the world that knows that you're a risk. They're saying, I don't trust you. I want your co-signer to be the person that has it. So why is the bank saying I need a co-signer? Really question it. Make sure it fits you. So once again, great for some, not always good for other people. Ask your banker honestly, is that really what you think the best thing is for all of us? Here? Yeah, o- oftentimes um, consolidating is a bit of a band-aid. If, if people don't have the recurrent income to to pay that new debt that they're replacing, it's just going to potentially um, forestall or, or push off having a more... I'll say significant conversation about ways to to break that cycle that they find themselves in. Correct. If you've re, if you've redone the uh, consolidation loan for credit cards, cut those credit cards up now. Cancel the line of credits. Don't obtain any new debts on top of it because it's just going to compound the situation. Uh, so somebody out there listening today, uh, what advice uh, do you give them as they as they walk through the doors of, of Hoy's Michaelis? Um, well, I I try to reassure people that they are not alone. That I, I appreciate the the apprehension that they're feeling talking to a stranger about this kind of stuff. And I uh, just try to reassure them that we're just having a conversation. There's there's no commitment. We're just trying to explore uh, the situation and the different options. It's very normal that that through the, through that process, after we talk to people, very common feedback that I get is, you know what, I, I've been thinking about this for, for two years, and I wish I'd talked to you sooner. But realistically, two years ago, that person wasn't emotionally ready to take that step. And it took them some time to to determine that it wasn't realistic to pay back the debts in full. Ask questions. Ask questions. Keep making the plan for the future. Can't change the past. What you got to focus on is the future at this point. All right. So uh, Scott Schaefer, Ian Martin from Hoy's Michaelis and Associates Incorporated uh, at the Kitchener office right uh, down the street from our studios yeah, here in two blocks away. Kitchener. Uh, they're on the web at hoys.com, H-O-Y-E-S.com, and you can uh, get them by phone. 310 plan. Uh, that's it for me on Ask the Experts. Thanks for coming in today, guys. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Neil. Uh, this has been Ask the Experts. You're listening to 570 News.